obstacle we face. And whatever it is, it suddenly, without warning, appears. And we have a decision to make. How are we going to handle this obstacle? The definition of obstacle is this. Someone or something that stands in the way or holds up progress. Are you facing the same type of obstacle each day? Are you trying to solve it the same way on your own? Today, Greg in the sermon is going to be talking about Moses and an obstacle that he faced. But today, I'm going to share about Peter. You know, Peter denied Jesus, basically betraying him. You know, he realized he failed. And he tried to go back to life. He tried to do the same thing. Try to live the same way he always had. He's trying to go back to him. But Jesus had something better for Peter. Jesus knew that when Peter just accepted that he made a mistake and he could overcome it. He repented. He didn't let that mistake define him, control him, overcome him. He gave it to Jesus. He said, I'm sorry. I love you, Jesus. Peter knew he was a disciple of Jesus. He, and that he made a mistake. He stepped back into his calling to go and make disciples. And he fulfilled that purpose. Therefore, that obstacle had no control of him anymore. Are you letting that rock, that mistake, that obstacle overcome you today? Jesus came. He died on the cross. And he rose. So it doesn't need to control you. Lay it at his feet. He has overcame so we can overcome. We're going to sing Jesus Messiah and one of the lines says, our hope is in Him today. Our hope is in Him. Let's sing Jesus Messiah.
to the song, I, I get so excited that I can't name the 10,000 reasons. So I'm going to let you name the reasons why we celebrate, why we praise God. So shout them out. It's your turn to share. His mercy. His mercy. Peace. Peace. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Love. Love. Healing. Healing. Abundance. Abundance. Eternal life. Never ending grace. grace. Always a friend. Always a friend. Comforter. Comforter. There's so many reasons. Psalms 103. Praise the Lord, all my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul. And forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sins. And heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit. And grounds you with love and compassion. Who satisfies your desires with good things. So that your youth is renewed. Like he feels. Like seeing 10,000 reasons. Mm -hmm. Thank <laughs> you.
we thank you for today, an opportunity to be here, to have already engaged in worship. But Lord, as we come, we realize today isn't about us. This day, this time is about you. And so as we come, we come bringing our whole selves. And Lord, in the midst of that, it also means those things that you have blessed us with, the resources we've been given. So now we set aside a time just to give back a portion of that so that you may take it and use it and bless it. And Lord, you have told us that as we give, you also bless us. We don't give it for that reason, but we thank you for your love and for your blessing that comes in so many ways. So these gifts today, we give to you to be used for the advancement of thy kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. 
So, I want to read a scripture about what we just did. Kind of. This says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you visited me. The righteous will answer him. Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? And this is what he said. He said, the king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. So you know what we do a lot of times? We see somebody else doing something, or we see somebody else that needs something. And as good Christian people, sometimes we'll say we'll pray for them. Praying is a good thing. And praying is something we should do, and God answers those prayers. But sometimes, just like you all knew, and I kind of stopped you so I can make my point. Sometimes we just need to jump in and jump, because we are the answer to the prayer. Just like Isaac was the answer to the prayer for Nora to help get the Bible back there. And you know what else happened? When Isaac stepped in and volunteered, I thought, well, maybe it might be a good idea for me to do that too. So when we do something like that, it becomes an example for other people. So we need to remember that, yes, we need to pray, but we also need to realize that sometimes we're the answers to God's prayer. You ever thought about that? Well, let's have a prayer. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for the ways that you work in people's lives around us when we pray about it. But Lord, help us to realize that you want us to do more than just pray. How you want us to be involved and where you want us to step in and be your hands and feet, your promises, your hope. Lord, help us to be your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I think you can go to your mission friends group now. Our scripture reading this morning will come from Exodus chapter 3, verses 4 through 10. Exodus chapter 3. Beginning with verse 4. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called out to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of the people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hands of the Egyptians and to bring them out of the land into the, a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Lord, as we look at this scripture, as we think and talk today about the person of Moses, as we consider his shortcomings, his challenges, may we also see ourselves. 
May we hear what you said to Moses and what it meant. But may we also hear what you're saying to us and may we take it to heart. This prayer we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So, this is a fairly familiar story in the Bible. You may have heard most of it, but I want to bring up some things that maybe we haven't spent a whole lot of time reflecting on. In verse 4 it says, When the Lord saw that he had gone over to the bush, God called him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. God was seeking to get Moses' attention. Did you know that God seeks us? Do you know that God wants your attention? I've often said this, and you've heard it in many different ways. Jesus loves you. Jesus doesn't just love you. Jesus is crazy in love with you. God loves you so much. And because of being that type of God, that type of God doesn't just sit back and wait for you. That type of God desires something special for you. That type of God pursues you. That type of God is seeking your attention. Let that soak in for a moment. God, the Creator of the universe, the Savior, the Lord, is seeking your attention. You ever really thought about that? Have you ever noticed it? If you didn't, it doesn't mean it's not true, because I promise you it is true. Scripture says so. I want you to look at Luke chapter 15. Take your Bibles. If you don't have one, I think there's a Bible in your pew in front of you probably. But I'm not going to ask you to read anything. That's, well, I'm not going to ask you to read anything out loud. But just look at Luke chapter 15. Well, I said I wasn't going to ask you to read anything. I'm going to ask for a volunteer. If you look at, at chapter 15 of Luke, in most Bibles there's probably some headings that describe the different parts of that chapter. Can anybody tell me what three basic things might be being talked about in this chapter? Can you see the headings and see what they are? Things lost. Things lost. What's the first thing? The lost sheep. What's the second thing? The lost coin. And what's the third thing? Son. Son. I'm not going to take time to read or go through that this morning, but I want you to understand, I want you to know the reason these parables are here is because it's talking about how important the lost are to God. And lost is being, being lost means anyone that is not in relationship with God. Anyone that does not know God as Lord and Savior. Anyone who is not connected to God. And these three stories, one after another, point out how important those things are to God, which points out how important we are to God. Whether we feel we are or not, whether we feel connected or not, whether we feel close or not. This is just one example. It's over and over and over in the Scripture that God pursues us. So let's think a little practically. If God pursues us, how does that really happen? What does it really look like? First of all, we just had the example, I believe, in Scripture. I believe if we read and pay attention to Scripture, we can see there. And I believe through the Holy Spirit, we have a sense that God desires us. I also believe this happens through other people. My guess is the majority of us here have experienced that where we've been around other people, other people that are believers, and somehow or another in the conversations, in the interactions, in the things that we just do together, there's a sense that God is there in the midst and God desires to be a part of what's happening. Have you ever been there? Have you ever done that, that you're just doing something and it, and it starts off, maybe it's just like you're having fun, maybe you're just doing something together that friends do together, but in the midst of that, it becomes more than that. And when it's all said and done, 
There was so much more that took place than what you thought it was going to be. And you recognize that God was there all along. And you allowed God to pursue you and respond to that. It happens in life situations as well, just the way life happens. And you know what? It happens in both the great things, the blessings in life, and there are a lot of things that happen. And unfortunately, we falsely sometimes think that they happen because we deserve it, or because we earned it, or because we made it happen. All we think is just a coincidence. I've come, the older I get, the less I believe in coincidences. They just, <laughs> things that I look back and I think just happen. I don't realize God had a plan in the midst of that. And um, just really quickly, I'll throw it out there so you see. One of those was having our two boys when we did. Chris and I had a plan. <laughs> our plan was that we were going to have our first son. We're going to have our next one maybe two to three years later. And the doctor reinforced that. Said, yes, you need to do that. Because the first, when Caleb came along, he created quite a start. And made things really difficult for his mom. And the doctor said, it will not be safe for you to have another child any time in the near future. So she was on birth control. She was doing all things. We were just knowing that that wasn't something in our near future. First Father's Day with Caleb, she said, Greg, you want to sit down? I said, not really. She said, I think you should. So I sat down. <laughs> and she said, Happy Father's Day again. We didn't want that. The doctor didn't want that. We were trying everything to make it not happen. But we look at our boys now. And we look at what they've been going through. We look at our life situation. I am 100% sure that God desired what happened. It was a coincidence. It wasn't an accident. And so if we look back, we see those types of things in our life. The same thing happens with the challenges and the struggles in life. We look at those a lot of times and says, Why, God? Why do you do that? Why don't you just take it away? Why not? But if we look, I'm not going to share a tremendous amount of examples, but I have them in my life, and I expect you to as well. And if you will look, you will see. Not that God causes all those struggles, but I think God allows them. And if we look, we see how we grow. We see how we become a different person. We see how we change. And if we allow it, we recognize God's presence more fully. And it becomes a blessing. In the midst of the struggle, as we sense our God pursuing us with love, with hope, with purpose. You know what? God pursues us all the time, even we don't want to be pursued. We see it from the very beginning. We just finished going through the book of Genesis. You remember what we talked about with Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 through 9. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool day. They hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man, where are you? They were trying to run away from God. God still pursued them. Did he pursue them just so he could punish them? Now there ended up being consequences for the actions. And it usually often, quite often is with us too. But the reason God was pursuing Adam and Eve is because He loved them and cared for them and did not want separation from them. And so there are times when, for whatever reason, we may be running away from God, but I promise you, God isn't far behind. Because God doesn't give up on us. Even though sometimes we may think He should or we think he has, because if we were in God's place, we would have given up on us. But God doesn't give up. But you know what? It's the lost coin, the lost sheep, the lost son. And we talk about how those become found. But if you really look at it, it's not just about being found. God doesn't want to just find you. God wants a relationship with you. 
Recognize the difference. Because there are a lot of churches that treat salvation just like being found and leave the relationship part out. You get what I'm saying? It's this thing where, where you talk a lot about Jesus stuff, you talk about him dying on the cross and raising from the dead, you did that for us, you come, you make a decision, you say God's the most important thing in life, you get drunk in the morning, you get wet, you come back up, and then it's done. You've been found. Yes, that's true. But it doesn't stop there. And if we think it does, we're mistaken. If we as believers stop helping others at that point, we are failing them as believers. God calls us. Look at the Great Commission. What does it say to do? Does it say, come baptize them, let them go, go baptize somebody else? Teach them those things that I have taught you. And through the midst of that, we learn and we grow in relationship and we become closer to God each and every day. Another word for that is discipleship. And as we become disciples and we grow in that love relationship with others, then we want to introduce God to others because He's so special and so good to us and we begin to understand how much He loves other people and we want them to know that too because we want them to experience it as well. So it's not just being found that the game's over. It's about building a relationship from now through eternity. God pursues us. God was pursuing Moses. Now, I spent a lot of time on that one verse, but I want you to know that. I want you to feel that. If you haven't already felt it and experienced it, you need to know it today because it's happening. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, God desires you to do that today. And that's the, the initial pursuit and I'd love to talk to you more about that if that's a place that you find yourself. But let's look at something else. It mentions, that, and as I read this, I never really dove deeply into it, but, but the word holy ground. What does it mean that Moses was on holy ground? If you go back, if we were able to go back to that place, it was, was there something special about the dirt that was there? Is there something special about that particular place? Is it, is it that was just the most sacred, holy place in that whole area? No. Holy place didn't have anything to do with the dirt he was standing on. It had to do everything with the presence of God. That was there. And when you understand that, we understand that we also Stand on holy ground at different times in our life. And so I took this and, and I'm, I'm seeking to understand this as the way God places it on me. So I'm, I'm not pulling it. Um, I'm using the example of Moses as I understand. The first of those is I see Moses as being humble. There was a sense of humility. God asked him to take his shoes off. That was an a initial message that something big is happening. But then Moses recognized who God was, that God was bigger than him, that God was almighty. And in the midst of that, Moses hid his face. There was a sense of a reverence for God. When we come to a holy place, when we're encountering this type of experience with God, there's almost an overwhelming. Now, this is my understanding based on my reading of Scripture. I believe that God is present with us 24-7. But I believe there are times like it was with Moses when there is a significant time. Times that are set aside. We have those times with others in our life, with our husband and wife. We spend, hopefully, a lot of time together. But there are some times that are just like defining moments in our relationship. So what I would see the holy ground being is the presence of God that is so powerful, that is so undistracted, that it becomes a defining moment in our relationship with God. Besides humility, I believe it, that being on holy ground is defined by looking deeper. 
I believe we've reached a point in our life that we recognize that there is more to life than what we are at that moment. And maybe we've been going well through life, but we realize there needs to be more. And so we're open to that in a way we haven't before. We allow God to speak into that, and something begins to happen. And as that something begins to happen, there's a time of transition. Another way of describing transition, I believe, is transformation. That something actually changes. And there's lots of different ways we change. We can change direction. So, when we're talking about being on holy ground and this type of thing happening, it, the change could be a change of direction. The change may be more about a change in our spirit. But there's change. And when you have this type of experience, and I believe many of you know what I'm talking about because as I talk about it, you understand it already that you've been there. It is scary, amazing, and wonderful. Those words don't usually go together, but when you have a holy ground type of moment with God, it is scary, amazing. That's kind of unique in the world we live in. Scary, amazing, and wonderful all at the same time. And so when you have this type of experience, it is not unusual that it's pretty quickly followed up on by a calling. Similar to what happens with Moses right here. We are created for a purpose. For a kingdom purpose. There are times I've had this in my life, and my guess is you have too, where we just get up, we go to work, we get a paycheck, we come home and eat, we go to bed, we get up the next morning, and we eat. And it just feels like that's a cycle. It's not bad. I don't think it's actually good. It's just life. And that's what we do. And you know what? That's not good enough to call. That's not a calling from God. It's to put it on all the pile in history. I promise you. God has a calling for each one of us. And I believe that those holy ground moments are a lot of times that those callings get defined or redefined. Callings, genuine callings can change. I believe callings most often coincide with our giftedness. They most often coincide with the situation that we're in. But I also believe that in order to answer those callings in the way they must be answered, the way God desires, we don't rely on our giftedness. We don't rely on our situation, but we rely on God's power. So yes, I think there's a sense in which it's just not random. God's not going to call me tomorrow to be a professional sinner. It's not going to happen. God did not put that giftedness in my wheelhouse. But He gave me other gifts. So I want you to understand calling is a part of who we are expected to be. And there was a calling that was placed on Moses. And that calling was pretty big. He was supposed to lead the people, to lead God's people out of bondage. Now think about that. That's a pretty big deal. God comes to Moses and says, I've heard all this, and Moses is probably going along and saying, yeah, I know about all this too. I'm a part of it. I've been there. He said, but you're going to take the people out for me. And Moses says, say what? <laughs> and then Moses starts talking. Moses starts giving excuses. His first excuse was, I'm not good enough. Exodus 3, 11. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh that I should bring the children out of Egypt? I ain't good enough to do that. And then, then he says, I ain't got all the answers. Moses, he said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel, say to them, to the God of your fathers, 
has sent me to you, they will say, what is his name and what shall I say to them? Some of you in your small groups are going to talk about that today. But God helped Moses to come to better terms with understanding for Moses himself who God really was to him. So that he would have him. God responded twice. Moses keeps going. The people won't believe me. Because he said in Exodus 4, 1, But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, The Lord has not appeared to you. You ever thought God wanted you to do something? And you're like, uh uh-uh. It ain't going to happen. It ain't going to work. I ain't got that relationship with them people. God. You pick your own person. And we say that because we're not willing to get vulnerable. We're not willing, after, first of all, God says, and Moses, you've got to come to, into terms and recognize who I really am for yourself. And then God says, then I want you to go and share my name as you understand it with others. And Moses has said, I'm just not sure they'll get it. And besides that, I think there's a little bit of him said, I don't want rejection. I don't want to make it fun of I don't want him saying, you don't know what you're talking about. Because he doesn't have the background. He hasn't already had the relationship. He can't know how they're going to respond. To him it doesn't make sense that they would just all of a sudden agree. And he doesn't feel comfortable with that. So he tells them. Then, God responds to that too. And I encourage you to take time to look at all of that scripture in Exodus chapter 3 and 4. We don't have time to read all of it today, but I'm just keeping up with excuses because of the reading for that. The, the next excuse, which if you're counting is number four, he says, I'm not a good speaker. The Lord, Moses said to the Lord, Oh Lord, I'm not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. God, I can't talk. You're asking me to go and be this living and do it. They ain't going to understand what I say. I can't do it. I want you to look close at the scripture there. God said, who enables words to come out of the mouth? Who controls that? Moses, pay attention. The other thing I think we see there is a lot of times we don't think we can be used because there's something wrong with us. Look back through Scripture. Look back through history. Look today. God uses broken vessels in the most magnificent ways to accomplish His will. Rarely are the greatest things for the kingdom accomplished by someone who has their act completely together. One thing, very few of us are there. The other thing, if you really pay attention, because those people have, like Moses was asked to be, they become vulnerable. And you can see how God uses their shortcomings. And the reason for that is because God wants us to be examples for each other. But Moses isn't done. He's got one more. He says, I'm not qualified. This is how he said, Oh Lord, please send by the hand of whomever else you may send. Exodus 4.13. God, I'm not your man. Just send somebody else. Somebody I know somebody else can do a better job. How many times have you ever thought that? Something needed to be done, and you knew it needed to be done. You were maybe even a part of a body, but you knew you weren't going to do it. You didn't know who it was, but somebody could do a better job than you could. So you're off the hook. Moses didn't get off the hook for that reason. So. I want to challenge you. Those times when God is pursuing you and you begin to get to the point of approaching those holy ground experiences, I would even say it's okay to do what Moses did. If you if you're observant about it, if you feel like you've got reason it's not going to work, talk to God about it. But if you're open, if you're listening to God, if you're not just saying, no, God, get somebody else and turn around and walk the other way. If you really 
spend time in God's presence and prayer and conversation and maybe even conversation with other people, God will have a conversation with you. And God will make it clear that He is going to be there with you. And if He has called you to do a particular task, if He has placed a calling on your life, you will know it. And you will be asked to have trust in Him as you pursue it. Because He has pursued you. And when you do that, your life will not be a routine of getting up, brushing your teeth, eating breakfast, going to work, coming back from work, eating something, going to bed and getting weekly. <laughs> because God's callings are scary amazing. I believe there will be, I believe there is more than one modern day Moses in our midst right now. Will you respond? Will you follow God's call? I'm going to ask our praise team to come. And I'm going to ask you. Is God seeking your attention by now? You know, you try to stop right there and want you to think about it, but I'm not going to do it this time. Yes, God is seeking your attention. There's not a person here, I don't care how young, how old, how retired or unretired or working or struggling, I don't care where you are in life right now. God is seeking your attention. Are you open to hear? Are you about to have a holy ground experience? If it's happening, you sense it. Now, not everybody is, is having that all at one time. I think they, the, what I describe tend to be some pretty special moments in life. And God's presence is with us all the time. And there are times that, that we just need to spend time connecting and reconnecting with God and growing in our faith and seeking Him and studying and, and, and building relationships. But there becomes a time in every believer's life because of the way we grow, because of, of what we're intended to be as disciples of Christ. That there is what I would consider a holy ground spirit, a call. How will you respond to that? And you know, I've talked to several people, and you'll, you'll know when it's coming. You'll know that it's there because there's a sense that there's, there's just a, you aren't satisfied with life the way it is. And it doesn't mean that things are bad. I'm not talking about when you have a problem and struggle. We all have that. But I mean, no matter what it is, it, even when you've sought God, there's been a sense that, that there's got to be more. And so in the midst of that, you avail yourself. You allow God to pursue you in an amazing way such that you experience God on an ultimate and intimate level. And you hear God speak. And I'm not saying that you'll see a burning bush like Moses did, but you will encounter God. And there's lots of different ways that can happen. And so, a lot of times, not every time, but a lot of times, those holy ground experiences lead to callings. And God places calling, excuse me, calling specific callings on our lives. Do you know what your calling is right now? I'll give you examples of a few callings. Some calls people quickly think about as missionaries going to Africa. People call to be a pastor. People call to be a worship leader. But you know what? There are other types of callings too. There are people that are called to be community. And you know what that could possibly look like? It could be a coach in Nelson County of any sport. And, and you're taking care of your loving on children. You're helping them to do the best they can to learn some things. You know what in the midst of that is? If you're a believer, you're also connecting to those families. You're recognizing their needs. You're seeing them through God's eyes. And you're being used by God to make a kingdom difference. And that's a calling to be a community servant. And you're living out that calling. Maybe your title is coach. But coach isn't your calling. 
being a community servant in a specific way is. Then let me tell you another column of someone that was called into my life. It was a lady that was called to minister to young couples. You know what she did? I've told some of you this before. She came to Christy and I shortly after Noah was born, I guess, because she saw him in a handful he was going to be. And said, you know what? You two need time together. I know you hang out. I know y'all all love each other and stuff. But y'all need time together, just the two of you. And so I'm going to take your children once a month. So you can go and have a day. That sounded good. Sounds cool. So we decided to do it. We did it. Came back. Thought everything was going to be okay. About a month went by. She called us and said, Greg, Christy, it's time for your day again. Which day you want to do it? She did that. Was it two years? Two years straight. Rarely missed a month. That was her calling. Her calling has impacted me in such a way that I'm a different person, we are a different family than what we would be standing before you right now. That's a calling. One last one. A calling, again, kind of along that community servant type of thing, but really helping bring smiles to people's faces and realizing that there's joy and, and God can use you in that way. You know one of the tools and a way God could do that? With a trash truck driver. Really? God can use a trash truck driver? Shouldn't they be aspiring to do something bigger and better than that? You know what I've seen? And I don't know his name. I'm not sure if he's a Christian or not, but the trash truck driver that comes by here every Wednesday morning and picks up the trash from this dumpster right here in our church. You know what happens when he drives by and when he leaves? If they're outside, he has Children standing by the fence waiting for him to come with smiles on their faces and he toots his horn as he goes by and he toots his horn as he goes by. He's their hero. If we are being who God calls us to be, we make a kingdom difference. And it's not just about the smiles he's able to bring to those people faces. If you've ever lived somewhere where there's a trash pickup, there's good trash men and there's bad trash men. Just like everything else in life. So no matter what you are doing, no matter what your career may be, that's not necessarily your calling, but each and every one of us have a calling to make a difference in the kingdom. I invite you, I encourage you to be open to that. The last thing is, now, like I said, if you're really struggling with things and you just don't think you can do it, you can make it, talk to God about it. Say, God, you need to show me. I need to see the strength. Maybe you need to bring my Aaron along. Maybe I need to trust you in, in baby steps. And then if you're open, I think God's going to open your eyes and you're going to see them. Maybe there are other people that help lead you along. But be open. To God's call. Let's stand together. Respond as God will lead.